All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, appreciate everybody coming out this afternoon. And I'd like to introduce um, Devin Bray. Um, she's the one that organized this class. So I'll turn it over to Devin. Uh, my name's Devin Bray, and I have um, host. I'm hosting, and I organized this training for my Girl Scout Gold Award project. And I would like to thank Invisible Fence for helping donate the oxygen masks to the departments in their uh, nationwide project Breathe. And I'd like to thank Chief Glenn for helping um, support in all this. And I'd also like to thank um, Caleb Corsi from the Texas A&M Veterinary Emergency Team for coming down and um, teaching the training. And Mr. Corsi um, has been a veterinary technician for over 14 years and a paramedic for over eight years. He is currently a team leader in the anesthesia service of the Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital at Texas A&M and a proud member of the Texas A&M Veterinary Emergency Team. He has lectured at the local, state, and national level to a broad audience on anesthesia, critical care, and disaster medicine. So I'm going to let him take over from here. Thank you. You saw the first part. You can just you can do it. So again, thank thank y'all for coming. Um, I know this is something y'all probably don't want to spend your Saturday afternoon enjoying, but. Um, I hope this class will be something useful for y'all, keep y'all a little safer, make y'all look, you know, a little more of a gold star. Um, when we first started talking about this class, this was kind of something that we wrote for law enforcement. So keep that in mind. I've gone through, after the first run of class, um, had a little technical difficulties switching from Mac to PC and back and forth. I think I fixed all those. I took some stuff out of these slides that I don't think y'all probably really needed again over and over and over. Y'all know this stuff. Y'all know how ICS works. Y'all know how to fight fire. We were trying to keep police officers out of burning buildings, and y'all are the ones going in. So I had to do some changes. But um, basically, we're, we're, this is kind of a pilot class. Um, this, is, this is something that's not been done before. We've taught veterinary technicians, we've taught veterinarians, we do a, a canine paramedicine conference every year where we take medics off the street um, and teach them, you know, how to put catheters in dogs and do intubations and all that kind of stuff. So this is, this is a little different, but um, when Devin contacted us about getting this with, um, with y'all doing oxygen support, I'm sure all y'all have seen the videos on YouTube and Facebook and everywhere else where, you know, the firefighter comes running out and puts a mask on a dog and the dog magically walks off. Um, sometimes that really happens. So we're, um, we're hoping this will kind of prepare y'all for that. Um, so if y'all have questions as we go through this, just interrupt me. You know, like Chief Glenn said, bathrooms are over there. Feel free if you need to take a break, take a break. Um, and we'll just try to get through this so y'all can get back to back to your normal routine. Um, like I said, this class was originally written all for law enforcement. So y'all are, are kind of the pilot on the fire medic side. Um, your, your morning crew this morning got to be the real guinea pigs, so I think we've got all the bugs figured out, and, and y'all should sail through this pretty quick. So because this is, we're in process of getting this accredited for, for fire CE and EMS CE, you know, we have a few things that we have to say, um, course objectives. Um, we hope that y'all be, will be able to kind of understand why we do what we do. Um, there's a um, lot of animals that get affected by emergency situations every day. Some you may see, some you may not see. Um, kind of a little bit of background about us and what we do as the emergency team. Um, Texas A&M being the only vet school in the state of Texas, kind of had some realizations when Hurricane Katrina and Rita hit. And one of them was we were very ill-prepared as a state to handle any kind of disaster on a large scale for veterinary medicine. So because of that, we wound up pulling everybody we could possibly think of to go herd cattle and round up cows and get water and feed to livestock and rescue animals. So the veterinary emergency team was a dream of one of our, our food animal professors. Um, and it has evolved over the last few years into a pretty expansive 
um, about five million dollars worth of equipment. We're completely mobile, self-sufficient for three weeks. Um, we can go just about anywhere and, and handle just about anything that we could do at the vet school, um, other than CT and MRI. But um, you know, we can do surgery. We've got medicine. We can set up an ICU facility. You know, we can handle it all. Um, so with that. Um, you know, there comes a lot of things that, that we're going to get into, and we're going to talk a little bit about kind of animal behavior, only because we don't want y'all getting bit. That's that's kind of the biggest the biggest thing I have is I know there's a, there's a lot of paperwork involved day to day anyway, and you don't want to add bite reports and getting all that stuff into the mix. Um, so we'll kind of go over that a little bit. Um, scene security is something that from an you know, an EMS standpoint, it's been beat into my head for years, as I'm sure it has y'all too, and it's on every skills test that you do. The first thing you say is, I have all my BSI and my scene is safe, you know. Um, this is kind of twofold. Pay, pet owners can be, for lack of a better term, flat out crazy. Um, you would think that there are, <laughs> you would think that somebody would worry more about their house being completely burnt to the ground or the fact that, you know, they were just in a horrific car wreck and, you know, their legs missing. No, they want to know how Fluffy is and what you're going to do about Fluffy, who's in the back seat. It's part of the human-animal bond, and we'll get into that a little bit. Um, we're going to go over some clinical signs, just some real basic, you know, this looks abnormal, what should we do, what should we think, um, and then give you some options for what y'all can do as far as emergency treatment and, and where to go next. So, I'm going to tell you now, sorry, this is kind of a little bit of the boring chapter. Um, there is a lot of research that's gone into studying the human-animal bond and, and, and how, that, how that coexists. Um, so, basically, what's, what's been figured out was companion animals, and when we say companion animals, we mean things that live in the house with you. It used to just mean dogs and cats, but now people have birds and they have fish and they have snakes and they have mini potbelly pigs and little teacup pigs. And so we generally refer to that as anything that lives in the house with you. There are some people that are going to have livestock. They're going to have horses and cattle that that horse or that cow is their companion animal. So it's a pretty big term, pretty big, you know, encompassing term, but for most of this lecture, we're just we're going to deal with the small, what we call the small animals, so dogs, cats, exotic stuff. Um, we actually just finished um, a couple weeks ago. We went and we were lucky enough to have um, a group out of University of Florida um, come up and do a large animal tactical rescue course for us. So we just became instructors in rope rescue and swift water and all that all that good stuff. Um, but applying it to a large animal basis. So, you know, you get that call that the cattle truck overturned. What do you do? You know, the horse that gets stuck in the mud, how do you get him out? Well, you can call us and we can help you through it or we can come help you do it and all that kind of stuff. So, um, like I said, companion animals, kind of where we're going to go. We'll touch on livestock just a little bit, but that, that's kind of a whole different, different spectrum. So the human-animal bond is something, like I said, that's been studies pretty, pretty in-depth. And it over the last few years, really since, like I said, since Hurricane Katrina and Rita, that was kind of, the, kind of the starting point for the federal government to say, there really is something to this, and, and we need to focus on this. So there's a, a lot of discussion as to exactly how it, how it plays out. Um, but basically, you know, it's a mutually beneficial and dynamic relationship between people and animals. I mean, I have a cat. I like my cat. It doesn't mean I like somebody else's cat, but I like my cat. You know, some of y'all are probably the same way. You have a dog. You may not like other dogs, but you like your dog. Um, but there's a pretty good psychological connection between those two. Um, and like I said earlier, those connections can be, can be really realized on an emergency when, you know, We've all probably run that medical call where grandma fell and she got hurt and y'all are going to take her to the hospital, but she doesn't want to go because she doesn't know, you know, she's worried about who's going to feed the dog while she's in the hospital and, and, and there's, 
there's a psychological balance there that has actually been well documented and has now been well studied to say grandma may have a lot more complications, not because she fell and broke her hip and had to have surgery, but because she separated from her pet. So like I said, it's, it's, it's really evolving into a whole new science. Uh, originally, um, there was a lot of discussion and veterinary medicine focused a lot of resources in rescue and response in the large animal field. And that is only because cows are money makers. I mean, you've got milk, you've got dairy cattle, you've got beef cattle, but you, then you've got horses, which you know show they you know they run barrels with. They've they're money makers, and then you've got you know your 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 farm breeds, your chickens, and all that kind of stuff. So they they're in a little bit different class than what just companion animals are still considered somebody's personal property. So obviously, in the beginning, it kind of made sense that you focus on what's going to save somebody money or make somebody money versus, you know, the dog that just lives in the house or in the backyard. Well, when Hurricane Katrina hit, that all switched. Um, Hurricane Katrina hit. Um, there were videos upon videos of dogs and cats being left in houses that were flooding. I'm sure everybody's seen... A video of a, I think it's a German Shepherd standing on a roof and the house is completely flooded around it and there's just boats and stuff passing by and nobody pays attention. Well, that raised a, a lot of, that gave the government a lot of heartburn, we'll put it that way. Um, to the point that there now have been over 947,000 videos put on YouTube of somebody f passing by an animal that needs some sort of rescue intervention. So, with that being said, when you're doing these kind of things, um, keep that in mind that there's always probably somebody around with their iPhone out videoing you. So, if you have the cat that you're like kicking across the parking lot or because you know it's wrapped around your leg or, um, you know, just, just kind of keep that in mind that these are going to be things that, that are going to get out. Um, you know, we, we try to keep, you know, we all know how, how it goes sometimes with, well, you know, the fire department took too long to get here. Well, you know, the ambulance ride was bumpy. Well, my pillow on my, on my stretcher wasn't, you know, fluffy enough. Well, this is going to add one more thing to, for them to be like, well, you know, if that had been here five minutes earlier, they could have saved my dog or, or my cat. So there's, you know, some things, like I said, to think about that always just kind of be mindful. Somebody's probably always got their camera on. And like I said, it's just been proven, like I said, with with that many videos and, and the 772,000 videos that we found, um, we put a poor grad student on that project and I don't know that he's ever going to, I don't know if he's ever going to like get those hours of his life back, but 772,000 videos alone of some sort of police, fire or law or um, EMS agency going by an animal that needed, that would have been an easy, just come here, let's go, you know. Let me get you out of this, you know, burning ring here. Hang on. So, and it just left them there. So the the d dynamic is changing to where if you don't do that, it's gonna it's gonna make your department have kind of a blemish on it, and we definitely don't want that to happen. So animal roles. Um, you shouldn't really think of animals anymore as as the luxury item. With that being said, I also am not the kind of person that's gonna go spend five thousand dollars and buy a dog. Um, number one, my wife would kill me, um, so that that's, would nix that. But there are people who do do that. So there are people, there are breeders, there are things like that where they're, these companion animals are their money makers. But we, we still have to kind of treat them as though that's Granny's favorite dog that you know she can't stand to live without. So we, we've got to stop looking at them as it's just the dog and start looking at them as the, you know, this is a, a pretty big contribution to this person's health and well-being. Um, so animal roles, as far as we know, um, they, they greatly decrease stress and anxiety. Um, you know, everybody's seen, you know, the, the videos of, you know, you have a rowdy classroom full of kids and you take a puppy in there and everybody just calms down and wants to play with the puppy. Well, it's kind of the same thing for adults. It's, it's, it's all in anxiety reduction. Um, with your elderly population, your shut-in population, um, even just your singles population, there, it, it greatly reduces their sense of isolation. It, it's rewarding to them to go home at night and know 
I'm going home to something. It may be, you know, a little fluffy cat that scratches their arms up and chews on them, but still, they're going home to something. They're not going home to an empty house. Um, pets have been well documented to help with depression. Um, I'm sure y'all have all seen some of the, you know, some of the commercials and stuff, and, and probably have even worked with some of the service dogs. Um, you know, the blue vest therapy dogs. Um, those are cases where you know some of those people, due to either psychological issues or um, you know behavioral issues, that that dog or, or that service animal, I mean, that is their their anchor. That is what they are associated with. That is what is allows them to go out and do what they do. Um, there are a lot of there's a, a big project right now being pushed through with um, the Wounded Warriors program and um, some of these people coming back from war with PTSD. And they're tracking a, a study right now with that in what those animals are doing to change how they respond and how they react to, you know, just general, what we would consider general, you know, everyday life. Hey, let's go to lunch. Let's go get, you know, let's go get coffee. They can't do that. You put this service dog with them and all of a sudden it opens all these doors that they didn't know existed. So pieces of the past is, is kind of a... A term we just kind of thought of. This particular picture was during the Bastrop fires, um, and I don't know if any of y'all remember those a couple years ago, four or five years ago, when most of Bastrop County burnt. Um, we, our, our team, this that was the first deployment where, where our team went, and it was right before I, I actually joined the team, but um, they went down there and were down there for 18 days, saw animals of every shape and kind that you could imagine. Basically anything that got found got brought through us. Um, these people lost everything. I mean, they lost their house, they lost their car, they lost everything in their house, they lost all of it. Some of them lost family members. And the, the real interesting part of it was all of these people could care less about, you know, their house, what had happened, any of that stuff. All these people kept asking is, well, by any chance have you seen my dog? By any chance has my cat come through here? You know, are y'all taking pictures? Is there something we can help y'all with to try to try to organize this and get this going? It was really an impressive, impressive sense of hope that they had that they would be able to still get their hands on something from the past. So this this guy here, he actually um, it's a firefighter in Bastrop County. Lost his house, lost his barn, lost his horses. Um, had a kid who got third degree burns on about 80% of his body and all the kid kept crying for was their cat. Well, we got the cat. So now dad, you know, who's lost everything and has a kid who's going to be in the burn hospital for months and months, he's got the cat, he got the kid, we're all good. So that's kind of the sense of hope part of it. Um, for the longest time, we, we work very closely with Texas Task Force One. Um, we are their primary veterinarians. We deploy with them if they go somewhere. We take care of all their search and rescue canines at any point. Um, they had a really, really tough time during Hurricane Katrina for those for their dog handlers um, to you know be out doing searches for people and know that they had to leave a dog over there. So Texas Task Force One is kind of one of the groups that kind of forced this this through into legislation and said, no longer we're, are we going to tell people to leave your animals. From now on, you take them with you or you get them somewhere safe. You don't leave them at home. Um, this is another photo from the Bastrop fire. Um, just kind of looking at some of the things that, that being, being from this area, I mean, I grew up in Bridgeport. Um, you know, being from this area, kind of know the area that, you know, you got the central city part but y'all also have got a very big rural area that you have to deal with. And so you're going to encounter more wildlife than what, you know, when we teach this class in downtown Houston, we're going to show them a picture of a deer and they're going to go, what's that? They're not, you know, they're not going to know. They're not going to know what that kind of thing is. So this picture kind of brought a little bit of sense. These are um, actually some of the people from Texas Task Force One um, found a cat. We had a... Um, uh, a firefighter that you know had been there, and I don't remember how many days he'd been there, just you know watching just you know houses burn, the whole landscape just completely change. And he came up to him one afternoon, and he reached in his pocket, and he, nobody knew what he was fixing to get out, and he pulled out these two these little baby squirrels, 
And he said, I just found, I found these, and I just stuck them in my pocket to keep them warm. I don't know what to do with them. But he said, after seeing, you know, seeing all this, I can't just leave them laying out there under the tree. So, you know, we had one that brought a chicken up. I mean, that's, that was somebody's pet, you know. I mean, it was, it belonged to them. Um, questions on kind of how the human-animal bond works. I know that's kind of, it kind of all makes sense once it all comes together at the end. So a little bit about body language, because again, I don't want y'all to get bit. That's like the worst possible thing. Your captain hates it, your lieutenant hates it, chief really hates it, HR hates it, legal hates it. It's, it's just real bad all the way around when you get bit. Um, so everybody's familiar with all the dogs that you see that bounce around happy, wag their tail, come up to greet you, all is good. Y'all know what a happy dog is. Um, then you have the excited dog, the dog that is not just happy, but is also standing very tall and proud, looking like, you know, I'm excited to see you, ears are up, tails wagging. This behavior can kind of get a little confusing with some aggressive behavior, um, just because of the stance they make. They have that, that position that they are ready to jump and ready to just greet somebody. Unfortunately, that, you know, could also be there fixing to go for your throat and rip your jugular out. Um, yeah. You have um, a little bit of an insecure pose that a lot of dogs will take, especially um, we see this as one of the common ones of, like, when you all go into somebody's house and there's dogs running around, if you kind of look at the dog, a lot of times you will see this this particular type of behavior. They're not real sure why you're there. They think you're there. Somebody let them in that they, you know, somebody from the house let you in, so you should be okay, but then they're just not real trustworthy yet. Um, these are the ones that can go one of, one of the ones that can go one of two ways pretty quick. They can either turn around and be really nice to you and love you to death, or they can tear you apart in a heartbeat. So these are the dogs, probably one of the ones more than anything to watch is the insecure. Um, usually, you know, they just kind of cower in a corner and they may wag their tail, but they're kind of giving you that look like, you know, something bad's about to happen. The fearful look, um, like I said earlier this morning, this is a horrible picture for this. Um, usually they're, we call these dogs spring dogs. They're all, they've coiled themselves up really tight. You know, that dog is really tucked up, tucked everything in. Um, that serves two purposes. Number one, it protects, you know, you got to remember, unlike people, dogs are on four legs. So all the, everything is here. Um, so when they're down on the ground, they tuck up to protect everything. You know, their, their abdomen, their chest, everything's protected. Number two, they can do that and turn into a spring and launch forward at you. So these are the cases where you will get, you will get mauled pretty quickly if you just run up to this dog and try to grab a hold of it. Um, a lot of times these, these dogs are going to be dogs that have just been in, in some sort of trauma incident, you know, in a car wreck or, you know, the, you have to, have to, you know, break somebody's door to get into the house. That's where you're going to run into this kind of stuff. Um, and then you have the, I'm scared, but I'm also going to eat you mode. Um, these cases are, are probably one of the more dangerous ones um, just because these guys are generally very unpredictable. They may turn and almost look at you like they're fixing to start wagging their tail and be happy. This, you know, They may already be wagging their tail, but notice that he's got his body turned away from you. And you know most of his body, he's trying to go away from you, but he's watching behind himself to see what you're fixing to do. So these are definitely, yet again, not dogs just to run up and grab and think all is going to be good. And then the, you know, the one picture that, you know, just because pit bulls have the bad rap for eating everybody, um, I would rather deal with a hundred pound wolf hybrid that's angry than deal with a little three pound teacup chihuahua that's happy. I just, those dogs are little land sharks and they'll just eat you. I'll take my chances with a big dog any day. Um, this is the flat out full on aggressive behavior. They usually plant their front feet, they're bouncing on their back feet, um, you know, they're barking, they're snarling, they're growling. This is the one that everybody should recognize pretty easily. So with with all those behaviors, there's a few things you can do to try to mitigate that that scenario. Um, 
And one of them is get down on their level. If you've got a dog that's aggressive enough that's coming at you, obviously you don't want to get in their face. But if you can, get down on their level, move slow and calm, and that will help your your chances pretty substantially. Um, There are very, very few cases that you're not going to be able to win over, especially if they really are just scared by just, like I said, getting on their level, working slow and calmly, and you'll win them over almost every time. Um, The one thing to be, be careful of is a lot of people would look at this dog and say that this dog is fixing to bite somebody. There are a few dogs out there in the world that actually do smile. Um, this would be one of them. Um, these these guys generally are happy. They close their eyes. They they almost squint at you when they do this. They wag their tails. You can tell that they're they are overall just happy to see somebody. But don't mistake this for the snarl that that's fixing to eat you. You gotta you gotta kind of work the difference on those. Um, dogs are generally by nature a little on the submissive side. Um, if you see a dog going into this position, you know, where they're rolling over on their back, um, those are again, ones that you need to get down on their level, walk up to them slow, you know, talk calmly and quietly, try to keep noise down. Um, a lot of times these are going to be cases that you're going to run into where, you know, you're working a fire or you're working, you know, working a wreck. There's a lot of noise. There's a lot of people, lights, sirens, you know, stuff that they're not familiar with. This is what's going to happen. Um, and like I said, again, slow, calm, and steady. Get down on their level. And it, you will win these guys over. Um, don't don't try to make it a habit to not reach out to just pet a dog on the top of the head. That, that's one of the ways that most people get bit. Um, just because, you know, the dog thinks that you're fixing. You could either hit him, you could grab a hold of him. So they're going to react to that and try to bite. So we we generally recommend to people... Squat down, get on their level, hold your hand out, and let them come to you. And that'll that'll kind of ease that transition where they're not real sure if you're okay or not. Challenging behavior, um, again, this can be any breed. It, it There are just some of them that you're just not going to know what's about to happen until it happens. Um, and unfortunately, we could sit here and I could bring our behaviorist in and she could talk to you for two days about how to handle challenging behavior and... And y'all are kind of not in the position where y'all are probably going to be dealing with this a whole lot. So it's kind of one of those we're not going to spend a whole lot of time. Um, remember your tools that you have to use at your resources. You can block a whole lot of dogs with a backboard or a ladder. You know, it's coming at you. Just drop your backboard right there and just let them chew on some backboard. Um, I want to touch real briefly just a little bit on exotics and wildlife because that is something that y'all are going to see up here. Um, exotics in their own are a whole nother ball game. Um, they, they all show stress differently um, and it, it would take a while to go through all of them. Um, some of them scream and, you know, everybody's heard the parrot that just screams nonstop. Some of them do it when they're stressed. Some of them do it when they're happy. You just, you don't, unless you're you're really studying this behavior, you're not going to know. Um, there are several things that can happen with exotics um, that y'all should know about. Um, birds in particular are very, very sensitive to chemical fumes as well as smoke. Um, you can actually heat up a nonstick pan, you know, just on your stovetop and get it just a little bit too hot and you know the nonstick is usually a Teflon type surface those fumes alone are enough to kill a bird in a whole nother room of the house so you if, if you're working a house fire and there's birds that are in there there's probably not gonna be a whole lot y'all are gonna be able to do for those especially if you're dealing with a lot of smoke um, there's um, things like um, you know fish are usually fairly safe because they're kind of in their own little ecosystem. As long as a bunch of stuff doesn't fall in their water, they're usually going to be okay. If it does, then that's that's a whole other prospect of, you know, now you got to get the fish out of the dirty water. But that's, again, something that y'all aren't probably going to be responsible for. That's an animal control type deal. Um, because y'all are where you are, um, throwing something in a little bit about wildlife, I, I thought would probably be beneficial. Y'all are probably going to see wildlife issues. Um, You know, as this area is growing, it, you know, the city's having to grow and move out. So 
y'all are probably probably noticing just running around here in town on the streets you're probably seeing more raccoons more skunks more things that you probably wouldn't see um, these are not things that we expect y'all to deal with that we expect y'all to know how to deal with um, mainly because most of this wildlife are going to be pretty pretty big disease vectors for things like rabies and distemper and things like that things that y'all don't want um, the one thing I will say is there's two breeds that seem to be getting quite a bit of attention and that are showing to become easier and easier to get. Um, one of them are exotic cats, and by that we mean, you know, tigers, lions, cougars, things of that nature. Um, it, it, there are a lot of restrictions on owning those, but unfortunately not a lot of people enforce them. Um, it is not uncommon for you to search on Craigslist and find a big cat on Craigslist that you can buy as a cub. Um, it, it's pretty easy to do. Usually you can pick them up for a couple hundred bucks. And people do it thinking it's a real good idea to have a tiger living in their house, which is not ever a good idea under any circumstance. Um, same thing goes with, with some of your hybrid breed dogs. So wolf hybrids, um, Texas, the law in Texas is a little wishy-washy on wolf hybrids. Um, wolf hybrid meaning anything that has been bred to a wolf usually it's a wolf german shepherd mix um tech like i said texas law is a little wishy-washy on that but only in the fact that there is no true definition and there's no proof that you can say well that dog's a wolf hybrid but that's a german shepherd and that dog over there's a wolf they look too similar they act too similar um so it's kind of a he said she said deal so with this, the, the, the reason that you should be concerned with this is when these wolf hybrids or these coyote hybrids get stressed, a lot of them revert back to pack mentality, meaning that they are going to try to be very aggressive and try to eat whoever is in their area. So kind of keep that in mind. If you see a dog that's like a German Shepherd, but nah, something about it just doesn't fit what you think it should, keep that in mind. Um... Any questions on that? Okay. Um, we'll zoom through this pretty quick because this is something that y'all do every day in your in your daily work routine. Um, so, and there's some of it that I know that y'all won't, y'all aren't going to have to deal with some of this. It's not your your area, you know, your responsibility. Um, so. Typical, just like anything else. Dispatch tells you this is what you're going to, this is where you're going, this is what you got. Hopefully, they're getting information from, you know, whoever's still on scene that this is, you know, this is ongoing. There's dogs in the car, there's cattle truck that's flipped over, and there's cows running all over the highway. It's, it's an ongoing process. So that kind of information, hopefully, y'all will have before you get there. Um, there, when that starts happening things to think about and I know you know when I've worked at different different areas um, on, you know on the human on the EMS side as well as the dispatch side you know we try to get well you know was okay so so she swerved to hit a dog did the dog get hit well okay a cattle truck overturned or their cows out because that automatically triggered us in dispatch to go okay animal control needs to go to this we need to send extra engines to this you know, those kind of things. But these are things to think about if you're going on these calls and you don't hear that happening, is that something you need to start thinking about? Okay, well, we may have a dog that's in a car that may be mangled or who knows. Are we going to be able to handle this or do we need to get some extra resources in here to help this? Um, I can promise you if a cattle hauler overturns, again, you're going to need the extra help. Find anybody you can. So there's a little bit of difference on the veterinary side than what y'all are used to on the human side. On the veterinary side, we, we, we have a more defined line of rescue versus recovery. Um, so, you know, y'all are probably going to expend all expense and whatever it takes to try to rescue somebody. On the veterinary side, it's a little bit different in we are not going to ask y'all to put yourself in danger to try to rescue a dog. There are a few exceptions to that, but that's those are mainly like working dogs like that we deal with with task force dogs. I mean, if i got to crawl down in a hole that's full of rattlesnakes to get a search and rescue dog out that I've worked with for years, then I'm going to crawl down in the hole. And I hate snakes. I cannot stand snakes. Um, 
So, but that, you know, that's just kind of some things, you know, we, we work in two modes, rescue and recovery. So on these kind of things, y'all are going to have to kind of think, think along the same lines that, that, you know, you may not be able to save them all. And if you haven't been put in that situation before, I promise you when you are put in that situation, it's really going to be a challenge. And it's, it's, it's human nature that, you know, you know that you've done everything you could, but you're still going to have to walk, let that dog or cat or whatever die. And there's nothing you can do about it, especially if you've got scene control things and there's a family member standing behind you screaming that you can't, you know, you're not saving their dog and, and that kind of stuff. Um, and, and also a big part that plays into this is, is where is this at? Are we talking in the middle of, you know, here in Denton, right here in the middle of the city? Or are we talking out here on 380 in a big vacant field where there's a horse stuck in the mud? That's going to play a big part of what you got going as well. Again, safety is number one. Um, you know, we don't want y'all putting yourself into any kind of danger. Y'all, y'all do that enough every day. There's no reason for you to to do that any more than usual. Um, just your typical scene size up stuff. You know, is it about to rain? Is it you know? Are you going to have to deal with flooding? Are you going to have to deal with tornado threats? All these are things that y'all need to think about. Um, again, back to scene size up. What's going on when you get there? You know, you can a lot of times get a lot of information from dispatch as to what's going on and 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 how things are going. But until you get there, we all know we've been there where they say, oh yeah, it's so-and-so that has a little scratch on their arm and you get there and their arm's half amputated and, you know, because they fell from 18 stories up. So kind of keep that in mind that, that you need to be fluid enough for things to change. Um, and that goes back into calling in your resources. Do you need extra help? Do you need animal control? Do you need law enforcement? Um, you know, I, I, I know a lot of times, you know, Law enforcement are going to be the ones that are going to handle, you know, like if you have that cattle hauler over, overturned and you've got, you know, cows that need to be put down, that's their department. Y'all shouldn't have to worry about that. It'll either be animal control or law enforcement. Um, big part of it is the owner there. Are they there with their camera recording and posting it to YouTube every five seconds of what you're doing? And is somebody going to say that what y'all are doing is wrong? You may do everything perfectly by the book and correct, and somebody's still going to say you did it wrong. It's just that we've all all seen it. Um, one of the biggest biggest things that we want to try to push is is that animal contained. If if you have a, a house fire that you're working, and you get into a room and you see that there's a dog in a crate, don't open the door to the crate and get the dog out. Carry the whole crate out. That saves you from getting bit, hopefully, and will also keep that dog from you carrying it outside, it tearing you up, it jumping loose, and tearing up 10 other people out there in front of the house. So kind of keep that in mind. Use, you know, if it's already in a containment, keep it that way. Um, again, crowd control, law enforcement, try to block your views if you can. Um, just, you know, just limit your what would be good press and good media Pending the outcome turns out perfect and, and like you want it, that would be awesome. But how many times do we all know that one little twist and something happens and y'all are going to catch the blame for something that that you didn't do that you didn't do wrong? Somebody thought you did. Triage, y'all do this every day, especially you guys that work on the engine or the ambulance all day. Y'all y'all know how to do triage. It is the exact same thing for a dog, cat, goat, sheep, horse, pig, as it is for a person. Um, there are some equipment minor modifications. Um, Y'all's kits that that we're going to go over in just a few minutes um, already have some stuff in it already, so you can do a whole lot with that little tiny bag. Um, I didn't realize there was some of the stuff in there that's in there until it was after the fact. Um, salvageability issues are a lot different in veterinary medicine versus human medicine. Human medicine, you do everything in your power to save life and limb and and there's no questions asked. In veterinary medicine, it's more you do what you can and, you know, knowing that sometimes you can't save them all. Um, and then the recovery and the euthanized part, um, like I said, that's something y'all should not have to deal with um, ever. That's something that, um, you know, animal control or a local veterinary clinic is going to handle. Y'all aren't going to be involved in that part of it. But, um, you know, if, if y'all can get 
get something to the veterinarian that they can handle. And by using some of these tools, you can get something to them that they may have a little bit better chance of saving. And that's kind of the whole goal for this whole course. Um, caregiver needs, um, you know, veterinarians, and most of them in this area up here are mixed practices where you get, you know, they'll treat your cow, but then they'll also come inside and check on your kid's puppy. You know, they do it all. Um, College Station, whole different ball game. Um, you know, we have people that just see cats. We have people that just see exotics. We have people who just do large animal. Um, and then, of course, being at the vet school, it splits into even more of, well, they just do surgery on cows or they just do surgery on horses. And so it, it, it's kind of kind of imagine a human hospital on a veterinary scale is kind of what, what I'm used to seeing. So um, animal control is going to be friendly. Um, it's nice to know that at any point you all can call your animal control because there's always somebody on. I like that. Um, that may save y'all a whole lot of headache and heartache. Um, we work very, very closely with the Animal Health Commission. Um, the only thing is, is the Animal Health Commission may take a little bit of time to mobilize. Um, you know, they're broken up into regions, and it may be a couple hours before they can get to you. Well, sometimes that's just not going to be, that's not going to work. I mean, if you have, you know, a cattle hauler that overturns, and you know in six hours you're still going to be trying to wrangle up cattle, well, absolutely, give them a call. They'll come help you. But what if that cattle hauler overturns out here on 380 and it's, you know, 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning and you know that you're about to have traffic pick up and you're going to have wrecks all in that traffic jam you've got going. You're going to have to call some other people to come help you until they can get there. Questions on that? Okay. Um, and if anybody needs a break, either wave around or stop me or if y'all just want to go that's fine too the the real joy of this will be at the end when y'all can all intubate fluffy up here um so capture and control is not something that we expect y'all to do but we want y'all to at least have an awareness of it um we've taken a bunch of this stuff out because y'all are not animal control officers i don't think um unless you do that on the side um, I know a lot of time, you know, the fire department does get called when somebody has a snake in their house or when somebody has a raccoon in their house. Um, working fire, I will not go get a snake out of somebody's house. I'm, it's just, just not going to happen. I don't, I don't do snakes. Um, but, you know, sooner or later, you know, y'all are going to get that call of, well, there's a raccoon in my garage, you know, and of course you're going to have to go in the middle of the night and rescue the raccoon. Um, but, y'all, again, y'all are lucky enough that you have animal control all the time. So, um, y'all, I just want y'all to kind of be aware of a few things so that if animal control says, hey, can you run grab this, you at least kind of know what it looks like. Um, this device here is it's called a catch pole because that's what it does. Um, it's basically um, a, a leash, a wire leash that runs, the end of the wire runs through the handle so you can make it larger or smaller and it's spring-loaded. So what you can do is loop this around the dog's head. It's on a long pole. You can completely control the dog from out in front of you. Um, learning how to use this and certifying to use this is, in, is like an eight-hour class um, because there's lots of injuries that can come from choking and things like that. So I doubt you will be using it other than an animal control person looking at you with those begging eyes and saying, can you go look in my truck and get the catch pole? And you will now know what it looks like. Um, so difference a little bit in, in how to handle some of these things. There's, there's going to be cases where y'all are going to have to pick up a dog or pick up a cat. Um, if y'all are in a house fire doing this, you're all going to have bunker gear on. So it's, y'all are going to be a lot more protected than Joe Blow off the street that just, you know, walks into somebody's house and because they hear somebody screaming, my dog's not breathing. Um, dogs need to be approached cautiously, um, ideally with a leash in hand. Um, in your kits, there are actually leashes that slip, so they're real easy. You can make a big loop in one end, just kind of fling it over them, and it, you know, it self-tightens down. Um, we like those because when they start to pull away from you, it tightens up. They can't get away, but when they come back to you and relax, the leash relaxes. We do not recommend ever putting anything on a dog's collar, only because if you have a dog that you're walking out and it's wet or covered in chemical or whatever, you know, that hair gets packed and, and dense, and then it just slides over the top of their head. And then you've got Cujo out there running the streets attacking small children because his collar fell off. 
So the slip leashes work great. Um, other things you can use, I am sure on all of your trucks you have pieces of rope and you have webbing and you have all kinds of stuff that you could fashion some sort of leash out of. Tie a knot in the end, make it a slip knot, and you have your own slip leash. Um, so that that's an easy fix for y'all. Gloves. Um, so they make a specific type of glove um, for cat restraint. They are horrible. Um, they look like big, thick Kevlar welding gloves, and they say they're impenetrable by cats, and they can't bite through them, and they can't scratch through them. Not such the case. Um, they will bite through them. They will bite through your, your gloves. They will scratch through your bunker coats. Um, cats can be pretty tough. So keep that in mind if you're dealing with a cat that just because you have protective gear on, you always need to know where their head and feet are. Uh, a couple other things, again, that y'all probably will not have to deal with. Um, nets and thing, you know, cages, trap cages. Um, animal control may say, can you go get my net from the truck? They don't want to go fish. They want to probably try to catch a cat. Um, fishing nets work quite well to catch cats with, especially as they're trying to lunge through the air. <sighs> things that y'all can do. I would highly recommend that if you are working and rescuing a dog, you put a muzzle on it. Um, there, you don't have to have the fancy, flashy, you know, pre-made nylon expensive muzzles. I guarantee you every one of your ambulances has rolled gauze or triangle bandages on it. And you can make your own little fancy muzzle with that. You put a loop in it, you tie the knot under the, under their chin, run it back behind their ears and tie a bow. It's, it's pretty simple to do. Um. The only thing I will say about these is when you make them, be sure that you don't cinch them down so tight on their mouth that they can't open their mouth just a little bit. You want them to be able to open their mouth, usually to stick their tongue out, but they will also pant through that. Dogs don't sweat, so the only way they have to control their body temperature is to pant. Um, so if you completely clamp them down, they're going to be in a world of hurt. That's why we don't recommend using... I've seen people use like um, rope and tie, you know, like webbing several rounds of webbing across there or use tape like you would an alligator um, that that tends to cause some problems so and it's gonna it will cause a lot of problems if you know they find out you did that and something bad happens to the dog and the owner gets wind of it but like i said these are really easy to do two knots and you're done um, and and you would be amazed at how tough that just regular two or three inch stretch gauze is um, we use that in the clinic almost daily and we're talking everything from little chihuahuas all the way up to big great danes that are trying to eat us um, it works very very well um, vehicle issues are, are a whole nother host of problems um, ideally these are going to be cases that you want to get animal control involved with from the start obviously there's going to be some times where that's not going to happen you get the call that somebody's passed out in their car, you're not going to wait 20 or 30 minutes for animal control to get there if you can't tell if they're breathing or not. It's just not going to happen. Um, so Cujo's in the back seat, barking at the window, trying to eat you through the glass. Um, there's a few schools of thought on things that you can do to keep yourself safe, yet still get to the person, still get the dog out. Um, First and foremost is always work slowly. A lot of times these dogs are just scared. They see this car as part of their house, part of their property, and you're encroaching on it and they don't know you. Um, there's, there's several schools of thought as to how you go about getting the dog out. Obviously, if you can get the door cracked open a little bit and get a leash around them, even if you get that leash around them so they can't get to the other side of the car, put that leash in the door, close the door, Keep them in one little section for a minute till you get the person out. Um, you can try to either break, you know, pop the door or break the glass, get the get them out of there. Um, I've seen people before where they just go to the car door and they just open it and the dog just takes off. Okay, that works, but now you got a loose dog on your hands. Or the dog just sits there with the door wide open and sits there right by the car trying to eat you from right there by the car. So you, you kind of have to figure out which way you want to create problems. I've seen people who have taken um, backboards and run them in the back of the car to use them almost like a cage in a cop car to keep the dog from coming forward. Um, I've seen them use pike poles to reach in there and slip a leash around them. You just, these are going to be cases you're going to have to get a little bit creative. 
Um, the smaller vehicles are going to prove a lot more of a challenge. If you have somebody in a little smart car, there's not a whole lot of room to work to begin with, and you've just really, really decreased your chances. So with these vehicles, moving, thinking about what you're doing before you do it will help. A lot of people, human nature is, you just stick your head in the car. If you will squat down and look around, see what's going on before you just pop your head in the car, you're going to be less likely to get bit. That You're not invading the space yet. Um, then you can assess, is this dog aggressive? Is he trying to eat me? Is he fine? Is the dog hurt? You can do a lot just taking a look before you just randomly start going and opening doors and popping glass. Um, again, animal control is going to be one of your best friends for these. Um, you know, y'all probably aren't going to be rescuing um, wildlife anytime soon, so y'all won't have to worry too much about that. Um, transporting animals that are injured is very, very similar to what you would do with the person. Um, we were talking right before lunch about, you know, how this works and, and, you know, you have to remember that dogs and cats are, are very similar to people. The anatomy is fairly the same. They're just on four legs. Their hearts all sound the same. Their lung sounds all sound the same. They all have a liver and a spleen and a gallbladder and a pancreas. It, it's just, just all the same. It's just in a little bit different position. So, if you have a dog that is not moving its legs, any of them, you're probably going to think just like a person, does this, you know, he have some sort of spinal injury. Um, dogs are a little bit different in that when you put them on a board and you, you know, either web them down or, you know, strap them down and say, don't move, we think your neck is broken. Some people will listen to you and not move, but dogs are definitely not going to listen to you. So when you're working with animals, if you have something that is, is very calm, collected, you know, really shocky, you can try putting them on a board or, you know, using a piece of plywood or whatever you got. Most of the time, using something that you don't actually strap them down to is going to be cause less damage long term. Um, so use a sheet, use a, um, if you've got a tarp, you know, something like that, almost scoop them up. Um, Stokes baskets work great for this because, um, you know, they got a little bit of a side on them. So if they're laying in it, they won't roll off one side or the other. Um, the worst thing you can do is have a dog on a backboard and not strap it on well and go to lift it up and the dog slides right down the center of your straps. Um, I have seen that happen a couple of times going down a couple of flights of stairs and it was not real pretty. Um, so um, just kind of look at what you've got around, what your options are. If you have a cat... Get it in a box. Get it in a pillowcase. Get it in something contained. Um, cats are notoriously quick, and they will get, get out of anything you put them in. Um, so, like I said, we, we use pillowcases and boxes all the time. Um, they can breathe through them. They're easier to control. Um, we actually just, the large animal technical rescue class that we took a couple of weeks ago, um, that was one of the things we actually did was learned how, you know, we were, you know, repelled down and you rescued a dog off of this ledge in our case it was a cat and they're like well you're gonna you can't repel down a you know six stories holding on to a cat and he's not gonna just freak out and, and eat your lunch so we said well we got rope bags down there so we just took cat put cat in rope bag tied the top and all is good so think about what you got around that you can put these things in to secure them. Obviously, it's a real bad idea to put anything in a sealed container like a you know a Rubbermaid storage container that has no air holes. Um, I wouldn't recommend putting them in compartments of your truck. You know, just exhaust fumes and things of that nature. Um, again, you can use you know there's these fancy nice veterinary versions of human gurneys, um, but. If you need to board something, a regular backboard will do, a piece of cardboard will do, a whatever. Um, you just got to get a little little uh, ingenuity involved and, and get you something that you know will work. Y'all are probably not going to be, you know, y'all aren't hopefully going to have to deal with complete packaging and transport and, and getting these things to a veterinary clinic. Hopefully animal control will be there or somebody will be there to so y'all can get back to dealing with what you're there to do. Um, but that's in a perfect world and we all know how that can go sometimes 
Again, carriers, um, carriers are great. If you have a pet in them, leave them in it. Don't take them out. Leave them in it. Um, even if it takes a couple of you to move one of these carriers, it's a lot better to carry one of these things outside than it is to let the dog out and then have to deal with dog running loose, chasing people, causing, causing scenes from that. Questions on that? No? Okay. And then moving through this quick. Um, quick basic anatomy, kind of first aid. Um, everyone in this room, I'm sure, has probably taken a CPR class and an ACLS class in the last four or five years. Um, so we won't have to get on that. Um, the biggest thing, yet again, I will say, is keep yourself and your others safe. There are a lot of people that get bit that could have been totally prevented if people would have just kind of thought for a second what they were doing. Um, second to that will be to keep the patient safe. Um, so unlike the human human healthcare system that we are all know and are so fond of, as far as I know, there is not a single veterinary ambulance in the world that is tied to a medical director that has, you know, veterinary technicians that go out and pick up sick and injured and take them to vet clinics. Um, so there's there's a lot of a lot of different issues there to to work out, um, and some of them some of them we're actually currently working on. Part of our team is actually currently building some plans and working on. Um, we um, our rotation, and I didn't really tell you all much about it, but our our fourth year veterinary students, you know, when they're in their final year of clinics, they have a mandatory two week rotation on disaster preparedness. It's not optional, have to be there. Um, and what they do is they go out and they develop um, disaster response plans for cities, counties, um, other government bodies on if, you know, a tornado hit Denton today, this is how we would handle the veterinary portion of it. These are the people you call. This is what they'll do. This is what we have to get set up for them. Um, we, we, they stay very, very busy doing that. And with that, they're, they're building in some, some care package. So what we're hoping for one day is hopefully very soon we're going to be coming up here. I think Denton is on the list already. Um, but what we want to do is we want to get it to where any one of y'all could pick up the phone and call, a vet, call the veterinarian, per se, um, and say, look, we're working a house fire. I got this dog. I've got oxygen on him, but this is what he's doing. And can we send him to you? Or can y'all come get him? That's that's what we want to get going. So keep that in mind that if you know if you have your whoever your regular veterinarian is until we can get something in place, don't hesitate to use them. Call them and say, this is you know so and so. This is what I got. Can I send it to you? Um, don't just leave you know the half alive dog laying in the front yard for the owners to have to deal with when you put the fire out. Um, so first responder areas, again, that's where you need to know. There is a, I know it, it, I know they cover nights. I'm not sure about days, but there is the emergency clinic here in Denton. Um, so it's just nights. Okay. So, but y'all all probably know what street every veterinary clinic in this town is on. So during the day, you're probably not going to have as big of a problem finding somebody as you will at night. But the Denton Animal ER, they're there at night so and holidays. So you can call them, and I'm sure they'll help you all and take, take care of the situation. I mean, that's, that should be a given. Um, so a few things that, that you all are going to see probably most commonly are, of course, going to be burns. Um, everybody's seen the video on YouTube and Facebook of, you know, the Chicago firefighter that saves the dog's life because he carries it out and they put the oxygen mask on it and a few minutes later it just wags its tail and is walking around. Well, dogs are just like people. That's not always the way that works out. You know, it's just like on the show, you know, you shock somebody and, oh, they just come back to life and they're all good. Um, so y'all are probably going to see burns. Um, they're treated just the same as they are in people. Um, toxins, wounds, lacerations, bleeding, um, again, it's just like in people. Um, the one thing I will say is I don't touch human patients without wearing gloves on because when I was an, um, an EMT student and a paramedic student, um, 
Charles had his nice medics and stuff tell me, don't touch it if it's wet and it's not yours. So I don't. So remember, with those dogs, you don't know what that blood that's on them is. Is it theirs? Is it from an owner? We've had... Um, We've I've worked a meth lab explosion um, down in Bryan, and those animals that came out of that house had who knows what on them. So those are things to think about. You should not treat those guys any different than you would a human just because it's a dog. Keep yourself safe. Um, always keep your gloves on. Um, respiratory stuff, you're going to deal with smoke inhalation. Dogs, cats, just as sensitive as people are. Um, drowning, um, choking, things like that. Same with people. Y'all, dogs are inherently a little bit, they're a little bit different than people in that they tend to succumb to carbon monoxide quicker than people do. So if you go into a house and somebody says, oh, I've had this headache and the dog's not moving and, you know, the dog's over there, kind of kind of use that to your advantage that you just got a tool and figured out what was going on real quick. Um, cats are kind of the same way. Um, if it's my dog, he's just fat and laying over there in the floor because that's what he does all the time. But, you know, kind of keep those things in mind. Um, heat exhaustion is another one that y'all will probably see some. Um, you know, with, with different areas having different canine search and rescue groups and police dogs and that kind of stuff, um, they may say, hey, you know, y'all got this really cool cooling tent over here. Can we bring our dog in for a minute? You know, he's hot. Well, depending on your policy, the appropriate thing to do would be, yeah, sure, come on in here. Here's a bottle of water. Give your dog some water, you know. But but just kind of keep that in mind that those are going to be some things that y'all could potentially help with. Uh, few little differences in pet anatomy. You know, dogs and cats walk on fours. People don't. So inherently, things are a little bit different in their airways. Cats have very reactive airways. Um, so cats will... Um, actually laryngospasm and choke to death. Dogs may or may not depend upon what the exposure is. But if you have a cat that's in a smoke-filled house, I can guarantee you it's probably laryngospasm and that's why it's not breathing. Um, dogs, on the other hand, don't seem to have that problem. So they're just getting damage further on down into their lungs that you're gonna, you could potentially have to deal with. Um, a few landmarks we'll go over. The ABCs, it's all the same. Are they breathing? Is there bleeding? You know, use your use your normal training that you do every day in your line of work. Just adapt it to the fact that your dog has fluffy hair and walks on four legs. Um, treat companion animals very similarly to infants. Um, there are, and this goes for a lot of things. Um, most first and foremost, they can't tell you where it hurts. Um, they, their outward emotion doesn't necessarily mean they're in severe pain. A dog may be over there wagging his tail and he may have two broken legs and be really hurt or he could have pinched a toe and be trying to eat your face off. Treat them like kids. Um, move slow, move methodically and things will go pretty smooth for you. Um, fluids and drugs, um, this is something that we're going to just barely touch on because I don't foresee this being something that y'all are going to be doing. Um, you may, depending upon what your local policy evolves into, this may be something that we can partner y'all with a veterinarian, and that veterinarian gives you orders that says, if you work this, you are allowed to do, you know, put an IV catheter in it, give it fluids, you know, and, and that type of stuff. Um, so that's something that, that, again, is another part in the, in the veterinary framework that's lacking that we're working on. Um, y'all will have in all of your bags um, you will have some charts we are not expecting you to take dogs rectal temperatures we are not expecting you to get blood pressures but if you're on the scene of a call and you happen to have a veterinarian on the phone and you can tell them that their heart rate is 40 and that their mucous membranes are muddy and that you hear crackles here and here and here y'all will be doing them a great service. So we have put on one side of this chart all the normal reference ranges. This is not, this is kind of an expanded normal version because, because cats can be a little bit different, but it's a good place to start. Um, so you'll kind of know what's normal versus abnormal. Um, they are like mammals, again, just like people, except they are 
walk a little different. So is their airway open? Yes or no? Simple question. If it's not, we need to do something about that. Are they breathing? Yes or no? If not, we need to do something. Do they have a pulse? If not, we need to do something about that. And then general status. You know, if you've got a dog that you just pulled out of a house fire that was in the back room of the house and the fire was, you know, confined to the front part of the house and the dog didn't get any smoke inhalation, he's walking around, he's running around, he's doing fine, you're, you're not going to have as much concern for that as the dog that you have in the middle of the living room where the fire is that's, you know, unresponsive from smoke inhalation that you're going to have to pull out. So canine anatomy, um, dogs are actually really, really easy to intubate. And by really easy, I mean I took this Jerry dog, I set it in the floor, and I let my five-year-old play with it a couple of nights ago, and he could do it. Um, oftentimes, you will not even need a laryngoscope. You can do it with just a flashlight. Um, the only, if it's dark, if it's sunny outside, you won't even need that. The only time you're going to run into a little bit of a problem is... Um, in what we call the brachycephalic dogs, and that's your dogs like your pugs and your bulldogs and you know the dogs that have no nose, they tend to have a lot of aberrant tissue in the back of their throat. So treat them, you know, you got to treat them more like infants. They're going to be a little harder to tube. You got to position them just right. You know, their tongues are a little bit bigger. You kind of just got to work around those things. Um, and what we'll do at the end that actually worked out really well for the group this morning is we'll have y'all come up and just play with this stuff. We're just going to just going to mess with it. If y'all want to intubate Jerry, you're more than welcome to. Um, we've got a tube, got a laryngoscope, y'all can kind of see. This is not, he is not perfect, but he is pretty close to, to what y'all can do. Um, so you can see with this one in this picture, um, you know, essentially they're just holding this dog's mouth open by his upper jaw and you can already see his retinoids right there. I mean, they're just, they're there. It, it's much easier to do. Um, you don't have to roll them on their back. They don't have to be on their side. You can. Um, and then sometimes if you're doing it by yourself, actually rolling them up on their back and holding them with your laryngoscope just like you would a person actually works out really well for one person. But if you got somebody there who can stand here and hold a mouth open for a second and still do this over here, it's just as effective. Um, respiratory emergencies. So dogs are a little bit, dogs, cats, most animals per se, are a little bit different than people in their primary, primary cause of cardiac arrest is not cardiac. Um, most dogs and cats go respiratory first. Um, VTAC in a dog is not, a, not necessarily an emergent lethal arrhythmia. Um, it is, it is amazing. We see dogs every day that walk into the hospital to cardiology that are in VTAC with a rate of 220, and that dog is bouncing up and down the hall and chasing a tennis ball. And if it was a person, they'd be on the floor like dead. Um, so there are, some, there are some things, you know, that are a little bit different about dogs and cats that, that are people. So most of the time, if you can get to these dogs and get their respiratory system under control, you're going to prevent anything else further from, from failing on you. Um, dogs generally don't have heart attacks. Um, you know, they don't live long enough to get coronary artery disease. It just doesn't, doesn't happen. Um, so kind of, kind of keep that in mind with, you know, when, when you're trained to just go slap the pads on somebody, don't do that on a dog. Um, you will probably blow up. Um, Nine times out of ten, supplemental oxygen will be your best friend with, with any pet, and you can actually do quite a bit of good until you can get them to a clinic with just a, a little bit of oxygen. Um, so basic airway stuff. You all all know this. Um, is their airway open? Is their chest rising and falling? If it's not, we need to do something about it. Um, with dogs, the thing that I, I really like about these masks that y'all are getting, um, you can actually use the mask just like you would a BVM. It, you pop your, your mask off your Ambu bag, plug it into here, put your hands on the side, shove the mask on their face, and you can just go to town. Um, so those are some things to think about. That will cause potentially a little bit more of a complication in a cat because, like I said, cats laryngospasm more than dogs do. So if you're not getting good chest you know, chest rise and fall, and you don't think you're getting good air exchange, reposition their head, reposition their neck, and we'll kind of go over that when we when we play with the mannequins a little bit. 
Um, dogs tend to be not quite as bright as cats, um, especially some of your, your sporting breeds. Um, you know, your goldens, your labs, things like that that are just all play all the time. Um, those dogs will generally get stuff stuck in their airway. Um, tennis ball pieces, sticks, um, you name it. We've pulled plastic sacks out of dogs' airways before. Um, cats tend to not eat things that they know they can't chew up and sl slowly swallow. Um, so there is a modified Heimlich for dogs. Um, I Before I show you this picture, um, it's an interesting picture, but um, there was, I was good for some chuckles earlier, there is some theory behind this that, that it works, but you have to think about human anatomy versus dog anatomy. Dogs have very deep barrel chests, whereas people are fairly flat. Um, people have gut, like me. Um, dogs don't. They generally have a very, there's not much in their abdomen because there's so much more space for their abdominal organs. So you really have to work to get an abdominal thrust to get something back up. But is it worth a shot? Absolutely. So I'm looking dogs. Um, you're going to have to get them up off the ground. So they're kind of using this one. Um, and the picture got squished, so the dog looks like he's squished. But got it back legs either either completely extended or even up off the ground a little bit. Let gravity help you. Um, and then do your abdominal thrust, but... When you do this, you need to, human nature is going to be to grab a hold and pull either straight up or backwards a little bit. You need to go forward with it. So almost taking your arms that are interlocking and pushing them forward towards the dog's head will get more pressure to push that foreign object up. So the modified Heimlich. Um, so oxygen mask, what we're all here for. Um, these masks are great because they're they're very um, they're very user friendly. These things are going to last y'all forever. They will. I haven't seen one quite like this, but I really like them. So this is an all-in-one deal. You can either pop your oxygen hose onto here and use it as as just a flow by, like you would a non rebreather mask, or you can pull this whole piece out and you can your ambu will fit right down in there. You can plug the holes and actually ventilate with it. Um, the downside of these is a lot of cats do not like having things on their face. Um, but these mask parts just pop off. So if the cat doesn't like, you know, its head being shoved in this cone, or the dog for that matter, just take it off and hold it in front of their face. A lot of dogs, if they're in pretty substantial respiratory distress, you can actually just put their nose in this like this. And since it doesn't squeeze anywhere, they'll just lay there with their head in it. Um... So keep that in mind. If this is not working, less is usually more. Take it off. Just let it hang out. Um, if for some reason you don't have one of these, just use your, your oxygen hose you know, off your tank and just flow some oxygen in front of their nose. Um, dogs and cats do breathe a little bit differently. Dogs generally are obligate mouth breathers and cats are not. If you see a cat open mouth breathing, something very bad is going on. Um, so if you've got a, a cat that's open mouth breathing, they need oxygen now. Um, if you see a dog that's open mouth breathing, that's normal. So, you know, how do you know? And we'll kind of go over that in a second. Um, Ambu bags, um, I, we actually use the adult for just about everything, but that's because we do it routinely, so we know exactly how much chest rise and fall that particular size animal should get in order to not blow a lung. Um, for all practical purposes, I would say if you use just one of your PD bags, you'll be fine. Um, but if you don't have a PD and all you got is an adult, then guess what? Use the adult and you, you go about it. Um, mouth to nose, everybody has all, I'm sure, seen this picture. Um, we don't really encourage y'all doing this just because you don't know what that cat or dog has got or gotten into or why it's unresponsive or what was in the house when the house caught fire that you're fixing to get a mouthful of. Um, so I would, this would be like last resort kind of deal, just like in people. 
Um, but essentially, all you do, hold their mouth together, your mouth goes over the nose in their mouth, and you give them a breath. Um, again, definitely not my preferred choice by any means. There is not a good face shield barrier device has been created yet for dogs like they're having people. Um, again, so y'all's oxygen mask, um, we actually have the ones here for y'all to look at and kind of play with that y'all will have on your trucks. So y'all, you know, it's that whole practice with what you got. Um, so we'll kind of go over those when y'all come up and, and play with them. Just kind of let y'all get used to them, putting them together, taking stuff apart. Um, Again, so this dog, you know, they're using it without the seal. Um, you don't want this. You don't want the the end of their nose right there at that oxygen inlet. You want to, you know, give them a little bit of space. You know, that'd be just like taking your non rebreather and smashing it on somebody's face. It's just going to be right there. They're not going to get good gas movement. They're going to feel like they're panicked and choking. Dogs will do the exact same thing. Um. On the back of your chart that we talked about earlier that has all your normal vitals on it, you will have a set of suggested oxygen flow rates. Um, I can tell you for most things that you're going to do with these masks, set it at three to five liters and, and go with it. Um, if you're actually actively ventilating something, you might up it to seven to ten, but but three to five will still get you, get you a pretty substantial increase. Um, so that'll be on there kind of as a little reference for y'all to go back to as well. Um, y'all know these things. Like I said, we talked about a minute ago, cats open mouth breathing really bad. Um, dogs and cats that are in respiratory distress do very similarly to humans in respiratory distress. You know, you'll get the neck extension. You might notice an abdominal component to their breathing. Um, think of the, the old COPD video that everybody has seen that, you know, in school that of the guy sitting there all tripoded over and can't breathe. Dogs do the exact same thing. Um, once you get, once they get to that point, um, cat open mouth breathing is usually their first response. And then their second response is they die. So the cats don't give you as much of a time window and it's not as forgiving as dogs are. This, um, this little dog was actually one, um, that was in our ICU, and it's it's the classic, you know. Imagine the the guy sitting there in COPD, you know, his head stretched, you know, he's he's using he's retracting his neck. Um, good example of of what it would look like for that dog in respiratory distress, and this is probably what y'all are going to see on your fire calls. Um, they're not, you know, y'all are are y'all are close enough that y'all get there quick enough that you probably won't find them unresponsive. You're just going to find them in severe respiratory distress. Um, cats, again, just like people, cats that are blue means the exact same thing. It's, it's bad. Um, these cats need oxygen and they need it quick. And you can do it with mask. You can do it with just stick the hose up there, whatever you got to do. Um, these guys were, um, you know, again, just showing different ways for the mask. Um, the dog picture, um, this one up here, obviously is not in very much distress. But this one on the other side, you can see they've got him laying on his side. If you're working these and they're breathing on their own, keep them up on their chest. The way dog lungs are built is it would be just like you or I laying on our back. You know, you got to get up and move around. You'll get atelectasis, you get pneumonia. So if you keep them up on their chest, they'll get better lung expansion and better, better gas exchange. Obviously, if you're having to do CPR, you can't keep them on their chest. You can't. No, I take that back. You can keep them up on their chest, but it is very tiring to do CPR from up above with dog on chest trying to do it like this. You got to get them on their side. So, so like I said, with with this particular case, I would have that animal up on its chest just so it gets a little better gas exchange. Um, cats, with cats, you have to be a little bit careful. Most of them actually don't like this little small size of mask. Most of them will actually tolerate the larger size better. And it's only because when you put this one on them, you see this cat can't see anymore. So if kitty can see, especially since these are clear plastic, cat will be a lot more relaxed. But most of the time, you're going to wind up having to take that black diaphragm off of that mask and just hold it up there and let the cat kind of do their own thing. Um, and, and just hope to get enough flow by going to help. Um, 
we all things that you, you all know um, oxygen therapy is a lifesaver um, it's cheap it's easy to do and you know it, it's not like you have to fill out paperwork to use it um, getting these guys to definitive care as quick as possible is going to be the mainstay um, unfortunately until we get something set up on the veterinary side like y'all have on the human side we're kind of kind of at a little bit of a loss but but you know make those contacts the next time you know if you have a if you have a pet and you take them into the veteran to the vet for whatever vaccines or whatever say hey you know look we took this class a couple weeks ago and would it be okay if we got on a scene if we called you could you help us out you know could you send somebody to get this dog or cat or can we send somebody to you with it can you take care of it for us um, so, so kind of start thinking about those things and always kind of keep that in the back of your head. Um, dogs have hearts. They beat just like people do. They sound the same. Um, we're not expecting y'all to be like, eh, well, that's a three out of four mitral murmur. You know, no, we're not, we don't expect y'all to know that. It's either beating or it's not. That's what's important. Um, you can listen for heart. You can listen, feel, um, you know, heart sounds are the same dogs you know you can just kind of put your hand on their chest and feel their heart pretty easily unless it's a really obese dog um, the other thing you can do is feel their femoral pulses dogs carotids are very difficult to feel as are their brachials so femoral pulses are usually our first go-to um, the uh, I've got a better picture but you can kind of see anatomy wise um, in dogs just the way their carotid is it's you have to like really cram your fingers into in, in under some muscle to get to it, so it's just a little bit easier. But you can you can see an anatomically speaking, you know, dog have dogs have cephalic and they have saphenous veins. So just just like people, it's all the same. It's just a little bit different placement. Um, capillary refill time um, is just like in people, except most of the time dogs have pigmented nails, so it's going to be harder for you to assess that. Um, you can lift their lip, look at their gum color, press your finger on it, it'll, you know, it'll blanch out white, comes back one to two seconds, all is good. Um, the other thing that you can use is in cats, um, I try not to stick my hand in a cat's mouth if I don't have to, um, just because cats bite a lot and I tend to get bit by cats quite a bit. So um, look at their feet. A lot of times cats' feet, their feet pad, foot pads are not pigmented. So if their foot pads are nice and pink and you kind of p poke on them and they come back, you're great. If they're blue or gray, they're probably a little hypoxic. So just kind of keep that in mind that you've got other alternatives and places to look. Um, heart locations in dogs and cats, the best, quickest, and easiest way to find it is to imagine pulling their elbow up to their chest and put your stethoscope or your hand right there and that's where it'll be. Um, you don't have to pull back far. Just imagine lining up their elbow with their chest, and that's where you'll go. Um, again, locating femoral pulses um, is really, really easy. Medial side of the leg, you'll just, some people just take two fingers, and you just, you know, they'll just go up here and go, oh, yeah, I got it. You know, well, take your whole hand. Just shove your whole hand under there. See if you can feel it. Um, Give it a minute because a lot of times, especially if they're really muscular, you may have it may take a minute for you to, to locate it and, and find it. Um, but no dog's ever been harmed by doing chest compressions on it, even if it didn't need it. Um, so what do you do if there's not a pulse? Well, it's the same thing you do as people. You try to give them one. So chest compressions in dogs and cats are going to be just like what they were, what you're used to and trained on in people. So um same same volume um of of recoils expected so you want to go third to half of the the diameter or the width of the chest um, dogs are a little bit harder to do compressions on and cats even a little more so just because of the anatomy of the chest having that that barrel shape on top and then and then going down at the bottom your hands will naturally just slide right off so when you're doing it be sure that you stay right on top and stay in a good position. The best way to find it again is to put their leg, put it up on the side of their chest. Okay, that's where heart is. Let's go. Um, so kind of keep that in mind. Getting them out into a veterinary clinic as fast as possible is going to be your best bet. Um, 
dog survivability off of CPR is very, very low. Um, you know, as is people, we all know that. So just, just keep that in mind that every one of them you do, you're not going to save. Especially if you're dealing with other things going on, like, you know, the smoke inhalation, you know, chemical exposures, you, you've got a lot more things to deal with than just, you know, a cardiac arrest. Um, you want to do your compressions, 100, 120 a minute. Um, cats, actually, normal cat heart rates can be up to 200 beats a minute. It's going to be difficult to get that quick. Um, dogs, depending on size of the dog, if you have a little toy, you know, teacup breed, tiny little thing that will fit in your hand, you can do it one-handed. Anything bigger than that, do it just like you would an adult. Get up there, get two hands, and, and be forceful. Um, cats are kind of the same way. A lot of cats, you can do one-handed but your hand's going to get tired pretty quick. So if you need to switch and do a two-handed method, you can, or you can switch from right to left. Um, drug therapy, this, this part is more geared to what our task force guys do. Uh, if they know that one of their dogs gets injured, you know, they have a medic that goes with them everywhere. Um, and, and so we carry drugs, you know, to do an RSI and intubate them and you know, treat, treat an injury that happens right there on the spot. Um, but kind of the general rule of thumb is y'all are probably not going to be doing any kind of real big ACLS maneuvers, but if you do, you know, you at least have a little bit of a guidance that, generally speaking, epi and atropine can be given to a dog and a cat at about a mil per 20 pounds. So if you remember nothing more and the vet can't tell you exactly how much to give, it weighs about 40 pounds. Well, two mils, here we go. Um, just like people, epi and atropine can be given down a trach tube. Um, lidocaine in cats is actually quite toxic. Um, so we generally don't use lidocaine in cats very often. And it's going to be difficult for y'all unless you actually really go all out and, you know, hook up your ECG and get all that stuff going to know whether or not you need to treat them anyway. Um, so just kind of kind of keep that in mind that, you know, if you need it, the vet may say, hey, go ahead and give it. Um, and same with fluids, you know, that's going to be something that, that a veterinarian is going to have to tell you all which way to go go with. Um, real quick, I'll show you all kind of a quick picture of where to place a catheter in a dog just in case you ever have to do it. Um, dogs have very, very easily accessible cephalic veins um, that run right along the front of the leg. In, in an ideal world, you'd have, you know, clippers in your pocket and you'd shave it and put a nice little surgical prep on it. In a crash situation, it's just not going to be practical. Um, so, again, you can kind of see it right there. Um, do your tourniquet or have somebody hold right above their elbow and it'll just, it'll pop up for you. Um, and, and usually that's one of the last veins to, to disappear in shock. So these are pretty good, easy ones for y'all to, y'all to get to. Um, that's a better picture of it. You can see it running just right down the top side of the leg. And it runs all the way from elbow all the way down to the foot. And it usually doesn't split until it gets right on top of the foot. So you got a bunch of working room there. Um, the, the second best location for y'all would probably be the lateral saphenous. So on the outside of the dog's back leg, right above the hock joint, will be this lateral saphenous. The thing I like about these is they're very straight. And they're usually, yeah, they usually don't have any weird branches that come off into them that's going to make catheter placement difficult for you. And it's just like a person. Um, trauma um, is always fun. Um, this was a dog that got shot, um, that got evac'd out. Um, it, you know, it's the same kind of thing. Just follow what you know. Put some pressure on the wounds, get the bleeding to stop, do what you got to do to protect the airway, and don't get bit. Um, Bandaging, um, y'all all know how to put a bandage on. Um, the only difference in people versus animals, you know, if a person got shot in the leg right here, well, you're going to put your bandage right here. Well, in dogs and cats, because of their anatomy and the way they move, we generally would wrap the whole leg. That's not necessarily something that I'm saying that y'all have to do because these are going to usually be very short-term bandages that you're only putting on until you can get them out to a vet that's five minutes away. But if you do need to keep a bandage on, it's ideal to wrap the whole the whole limb. Um, 
again, just like with people, you know, make sure you don't get too tight. Um, you know, check for pulses before and after. Um, fractures, um, again, splint them. You know, just like you would in a person. Unfortunately, there's there's going to be some some difficulty in y'all getting pain meds into into dogs and cats just because y'all don't have a, a veterinarian with you on your calls. Um, so, but splinting a fracture will you know just like in a person will decrease pain. So splint them and get them out. Um, ideally, you know, again. You'd give this dog a bunch of fentanyl and pop a tube in it and put a bandage on him and send him on his way, but y'all aren't going to – that luxury is, is years down the road. Um, just a quick couple of pictures on how to bandage. Um, we always start at the toes, but because of the way, you know, blood flow and lymphatic drainage, you need to start at the toes and work your way up the body, just like you would if you were putting a cast on a person. You wouldn't start at their hip and work your way down their foot. Um, the, these don't have to be fancy. You don't have to have the fancy um, coban and vet wrap and all that. You can do them. Throw a you know you get a dog with a abdominal wound. You know stick an abdominal dressing on it, wrap it on, and go. Um, they don't have to be pretty. They're not going to stay on weeks. We're looking at a matter of minutes that it'll be there. Um, just another one. This is a, a fracture that they immobilized. Um, again, real pretty bandage, but that's because it's meant to go home in that for days. So not not necessarily your field work stuff um real quick on, on heat stroke because that may be something that y'all actually may experience with um you know some of your working dogs that y'all are probably around dogs and people work are very similar except dogs don't sweat they have to be able to pant to burn off heat um, anything over 107 we say is dangerous we have dogs that we work with, um, with the search and rescue dogs, that their temps are 100 degrees, 101 degrees, which is perfectly normal. They go up and work a pile for five minutes and come back down, and their temps are 107. So it doesn't take long for them to jump up. And as long as those spikes are limited, we don't see the problems in animals like we see in people. Um, but you will, over long term, you know, start seeing kidney issues and seizures and, and things like that. Um, so the respiratory system is how most of them cool off, also in their feet. Um, if you can get their feet cool and wet, they actually will burn a lot of body heat off in their feet. We're not saying spray the whole dog down with ice water. Pour some ice out on the ground and let them stomp around in it for a few minutes. It'll, it'll do wonders for cooling them down. Um, moving them to a cool environment, you know, if, if you've got, you know, say one of your police dogs that's been out chasing somebody and, you know, you think he's hot, just say, hey, you know, you want to put him in the cab of the truck for a second? We got the AC on. Let him cool off a minute. You know, think about, you know, how y'all how y'all do your rehab for your, you know, your coworkers and your teammates whenever y'all are working a fire. Those dogs are going to be the same thing, especially if you're working a big incident where you're doing you know, big dog search and rescue, and you have 20, 30 canines up here working. They're going to need a place where they can go and cool off. Um, IV fluids, of course, would be ideal treatment, but we don't expect y'all to be able to do that, you know, right now. Give them a bottle of water. Um, mixing a little bit of Gatorade in with it will actually a lot of times make them want to drink it more. Dogs really like the lemon-lime flavor. I, I don't understand it, but give them a little bit of a little bit of Gatorade in there, and that'll, you know, kind of help entice them to drink more water. Um, this was one, you know, again that that we dealt with at the school. We just took some cool towels, throw some cool towels over him, a couple ice packs, put a fan on him. Um, you know, just think about what you're doing. You know, this dog, um, this dog was actually not hyperthermic. He actually just staged for a photo. So, you know, in an ideal world, we'd have him right on the bare floor because the bare floor is going to be cooler than having that blanket under him. Um, the things to think about, though, when you do this is we don't want to cool them off so cool that they actually get hypothermic. So when they start getting down to 103, 102 degrees, stop what you're doing and let's, you know, let's shift back to just normal, normal thermic procedures. Um, chemical stuff, y'all handle the hazmat stuff, y'all are the specialists with that, we are not. So y'all will know if you go into a house that's had a meth lab explode or that's had, 
you know, some sort of chemicals that you know are there, those are going to be things y'all can handle. Um, we dealt with this a little bit when we when we deployed to West for the fertilizer plant explosion. You know, not knowing exactly what was there when that place exploded, and you know that happened at. We got the phone call about three o'clock that morning. They'd been fighting it for several hours. We got up there about nine the next that morning. Um, you know, there were still animals running around that had been in those chemicals and stuff. So, of course, then we had to deal with that because nobody had thought about the decon piece of it. You know, what do we do with this dog that's got something on it that we don't know what it is? Um, most of the time, um, bathing them with, I mean, just regular soap and water is all you're going to have to do. Hose them off, you know, get your truck hose, spray them down, and you're good to go. Um, we actually have a grad student, and this is him. His his whole master's project has been on animal decontamination because there's nothing out there on it, really. Um, he's working on a project and has actually built a self-contained decon unit where we can we can work through you know with chemical resistant gloves and whatnot and safely decon these animals in an enclosed environment where all the water is pumped off, um, and then of course you know then we'd go through the hazmat decon ourselves. But we're just kind of, you know, he's playing with some different prototypes right now. So first aid, um, just kind of a, a little bit of a recap. Um, and then we'll we'll kind of play with these masks in a minute, and then we'll get y'all out of here. Whoops, sorry. Um, remember, again, safety is your biggest deal. And, and the only reason I keep drilling that in your head is there are so many dog bites that happen that are preventable that either winds up getting an animal euthanized or put in quarantine that didn't have to happen. So if we can prevent just one of those, it'll make a big difference. Um, use your triage skills. You guys know when something's wrong and when something's out of the ordinary. You all know this. Um, you know your city better than anybody here. Um, so you know what's around. Um, think of, of, of a systemic approach just like you would at people. Start at the head and work your way down. Just think of them as kids. You know, they can't tell you where it hurts. They're going to try to kick you. They're going to try to bite you. They're going to be screaming. Um, and 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 they they do have four legs and they walk kind of funny, but but their anatomy is still completely the same of that of a, of an adult. Um, you know, all the organs are still there. They're just in a little bit different spot. Any questions? Okay. Um, if y'all want to come up, we'll kind of play. That's pretty much all I've got. I'm sure Chief Glenn will have something for you. Um, oh, okay. Um, but I want to kind of go over, um, like I said, just kind of how to use these, what's in the bag, how to hook stuff up, um, kind of what comes with it. Let me find my... Um, so with these, with these kits that y'all are going to get... There's, there's a lot of stuff in here. Number one, you're going to get this bright yellow slip leash. So you already have one of these. This is what I was talking about. If you need to make something, rope, webbing, whatever, this will hopefully prevent you all from needing it. So keep this in mind when you're on that scene. Even if you don't need oxygen, hey, this is in the bag already. Um, you get a couple of different sizes of masks. These, there is not a right or wrong answer as far as the size of mask that you use. Cats, even though this mask is designed for cats, a lot of times are not going to like it. Um, you can try it. It works great to pull this part off and use it just as flow by, but they just, they just don't like being squeezed and not being able to see. So you get a step up and you're good to go. All these work the same way. Um, they all have um, exhaust holes on the side that you can plug to actually do positive pressure ventilation with, so just like you would with your BVM. Um, they all have adapters on the top where you can just plug your hose off of your oxygen cylinder onto them. They also all pop out and the connector off your Ambu bag fits right in here so you can do your positive pressure ventilation. One thing I did learn when I was pulling one of these apart earlier is when y'all get these on the truck, um, pop all these things out and put them back in there. They're just, they're really, really tied in here because they're, I mean, they're brand new. So just pop them out, put them back in. That way it kind of breaks the lot, the seal on them. So when you actually need them, you're not having to fumble with trying to get these parts and pieces out. So the way this works is, is very simple. Um, you have evil scary cat, and I'm very sorry, this will scare small children. Um, 
cats generally do best when they're being held um and 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 it's we're not talking you know hold it upside down or on its side cats do well close to you so keep your bunker coat on because cats have back claws and nobody wants scratch marks all over their abdomen but if you'll hold them calm and easily really support their back end with your elbow kind of you know snug them up to you then you can take this and just put the oxygen mask on with this cat if we were using this big of a mask if he was not if he was tolerating this you could try to go all the way but some of them don't like having their eyes covered so then you're going to have to back it up um, the main thing is you just want to be sure you get the nose and all the way to the back side of the lips covered with this mask in the same token if you need to switch from doing you know flow by oxygen just to support them all you have to do is again ideally would keep them sternal but it's going to be really hard to do by yourself um, you can take lay them lateral you can have the mask on occlude the holes on the side of the mask and squeeze your bag if this has got a good seal it will actually just move forward a little bit it won't pop off so you don't have to worry about you know holding under the jaw perfectly and keeping it straight it'll kind of hold itself on and support itself so kind of keep that in mind when y'all are using these that if that, that you don't have to have five people sitting here holding this on the cat's head just get it on there tight cover the holes and you can go with your ambu bag questions on those like I said, they're pretty easy. The other thing that I really, really like about these kits is they come with a, a laminated sheet. And this sheet's got everything from instruction to cleaning and all that stuff on it. And on the back, it's got a really nice, just your BLS algorithm, except switch to pets. Um, so even if you remember nothing from today, you can go off of this and just go at it, you know, line by line. So y'all will have all these, um, and then like I said, they've made, um, Devin has made the uh, normals and the O2 flow rate sheets for y'all, so you'll have those as well. Questions on masks? Everybody think they could use them? I know you can. So the one thing we do want to do um, that actually got some really good interest earlier, um, was on y'all's way out today, I want everybody to come up and just take a look at Fluffy. Um, and I want you to take a look at the airway. It's not exactly perfect, like what you will see in real life, but it is really, really close. So I want you all to actually visualize it and see so you'll know, you know, if you had to intubate something that, that you know, you could do it. Um, and, and I apologize, this is actually a brand new one. So it's, his jaw is a little stiff. Um, the ones that the fourth year students get, they get used pretty rough and hard. Um, so they're a little little easier to intubate. But like I said, I want y'all to just take a look at this. We need to play with these masks, see if y'all are comfortable using them, if you have any questions, and we can address them now versus having to, you know, having to go retrain later on. Okay? Caleb, can you just demonstrate real quick the best positioning on that dog for um, Sure. So a couple different ways. Um, Again, like I said, you can do them sternal, but then you're squeezing from the sides and you really, I mean, you're really working your arms out. So what we do with these is you've got them on their side. You'll just bend their elbow up to their chest and that's going to give you the area that's going to be covered by the most cardiac mass. Well, once you find that, just like you would in a person, put your arms on and just go. Um, dogs, like I said, we said earlier, dogs and cats are a little bit a little bit more difficult in just the fact that the way their chest shape is, your hands tend to want to just slide down their chest. So be sure when you're doing compressions that you're going, you're staying up and down and you're not just sliding down the dog while you're doing it. Um, there are some extremely large breed dogs that you can actually do chest compressions and have somebody do a, an abdominal component with it and that'll give you a little bit better cardiac return but a lot of times you all aren't going to have the resources and the people to, you know, we have something in ICU and we've got 12 people standing there who are ready to do compressions. Y'all probably aren't going to have that. So keep that in mind that, you know, y'all can do, you know, y'all can do chest compressions just as easily as I can. Um, you just need to be careful with, with hand placement a little bit. Um, with pulses, this dog actually has a fake femoral pulse. 
um, that y'all might feel it's in the exact perfect anatomical location um, and it's it's a big it's a big piece of tubing so you can feel it um, and that'll kind of give you a feel of what the actual artery in a real dog would feel like as well um, the kitty unfortunately does not intubate um, but that's it's actually our IV practice cat, cat that we use um, but but chest compressions on the cat would be just the same bend the elbow up you want to try to get you know your 100 120 compressions a minute give a breath every you know three to five seconds you know just your basic BLS care and I would not recommend using AEDs or defibbing these guys because nine times out of ten that's not going to be your problem that's going to be you know if y'all are getting to the point where you're having a defibrillator dog it's probably beyond you know what y'all are going to handle in the field okay well I just want to take a quick opportunity to thank Caleb one more time he traveled 200 miles to come up and teach the class for us um, more than that, Devin, for uh, for setting all of this up, and um, and then Invisible Fence for providing us additional um, mass to carry carry on our engines. If anybody's associated with another fire department, um, uh, just you can get with um, with Devin, and she's got all the stuff. She can sign up to get you a donation of um, of mass for for that department. So if anybody else. Um, is tied up with another department that needs those um she she can get you going with the donation for them also so but other than that um if everybody will just come up here circle around um get some hands-on practice real quick and um devin did you have anything else okay that's it then thanks for your time